Hello, welcome to the Leaders Room. We're sitting here at the Leadership Energy Summit Asia 2016. And as always, this is where the Eclipse Leadership and Governance Center tries to bring you the best mind of not just Asia, but from the world. And uh, you know, it's an honor and privilege for me to, today, I'm actually very excited today, you know, to be sitting here with uh, Dr. Professor Michio Kaku, uh, an author of many, many books, The Great Mind of, this, uh, of Our Era. And we're going to be talking to him a little bit about the linkage between what he wrote in this book and uh, leadership energy. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Michel, for joining us today. Glad to be here. We'll have about 15 minutes to engage in a short conversation. Sure. So uh, let me get right to, into it, and then feel free to, to take it however you wish. Uh, well, you're a scientist, right, as we all know, and you're sitting here at a leadership conference. Mm -hmm. And many people say that leadership is an art. So how do you feel about that? Is, is it absolute art, or does science have something to do with it? Well, some people think you have to be a born scientist, a born genius in order to do science. Nope, I don't think so. Take a look at Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, right? Some people say, oh, they're geniuses. It's in their genes. I don't think so. First of all, Bill Gates did not discover or invent the PC. Neither did Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs went to Xerox Park in Silicon Valley, and there it was. He saw somebody else working on the PC, the laser printer, the mouse, and the graphics interface, which we call Windows. And all of a sudden, Steve Jobs says, that's the future. Right. Now, what happened to Xerox Park? They had everything. They had a grand slam. They, ha they invented the PC, the laser printer, and the mouse. They didn't do anything with it because they said, well, you can't copy paper. We're a Xerox company. We make paper copies. Right. You can't make paper copies with this PC thing. Mm -hmm. So they did nothing. Uh -huh. Steve Jobs took it and ran with it to create it the biggest corporation on the planet Earth. Right. Now, what's the lesson here? The lesson here is leadership is not genius. Okay. Leadership is having a clear vision of the future. And then the energy and foresight and focus necessary to push it through all the bureaucracy and all the naysayers, right? Okay. Same thing with Bill Gates. Bill Gates did not invent Windows. Mm -hmm. Windows also came from Xerox Park. Right. He didn't even create the operating system for the IBM PC. <laughs> but like a surfer, mm -hmm. he saw the wave. Okay. He got on the wave. He rode the wave mm -hmm. for all it's worth. That's what leaders do. Leaders do not create waves. Waves occur independent because of historical things, inventions, and what have you. Sure. But they're the ones who say, I have a vision. And the vision is to ride, ride the wave, and change society as a consequence, right? Yeah. And so that's why I say that leadership is not genetic. You're not born leaders. Right. It's an acquired taste. You have to learn. You have to see the opportunity and run with it for all it's worth. And that's what they did. So what I'm hearing, actually, that's the, probably the most scientific description of, uh, of leadership I've heard in a long time. You, know, you have waves, you have energy propelling us forward. And a vision, a clear energy. vision of where you want to go, right? OK, great. So um, I couldn't help walking around the conference and noticing that you know, your book is very popular amongst the attendees. You know, people walking around with your book, maybe not for themselves and for their sons and daughters. So maybe if I could ask you just to speak briefly about you know, the stories behind the book. Why did you choose to write this latest book, Future of the Mind? And uh, how do you hope to have it uh, be used? Well, what are the two greatest mysteries in all of science? In all of science, there are two great mysteries. First is the origin of everything, the Big Bang. That's what I do for a living. That's my day job. <laughs> I work on the Big Bang theory. I, w I work on something called string theory. However, the other great mystery is sitting on your shoulders right now. Why do we think? How do we think? How did we get here? What is, what is consciousness? What is the mind? You know, every day you wake up in the morning and you see yourself, and you wonder, who's sitting there behind those eyes? I mean, what is it that's animating this person called me? Now, throughout history, people said it's too hard. It's a black box. You open it up, there's nothing there but a bunch of flesh, right? But now we have physics. We can peer into the living brain with MRI machines. And you see all these breakthroughs. Every month, a new breakthrough being made in neuroscience. Right. You realize, for example, we can now record memories. Uh -huh. This was once considered straight out of fantasy. Okay. 
We can even begin the process of photographing a dream. Okay. One day you'll wake up in the morning, push a button, and see the dream that you had last night, uh -huh. right? Okay. And we do this with MRI machines. Right. Mental illness. This is why President Barack Obama got interested in this whole subject. Sure. Mental illness is mentioned in the Bible. Uh -huh. It's one of the oldest afflictions of the human race. But what is mental illness, right? right. We can now peer into the brain and see how mental illness operates. Okay. For example, schizophrenia. 1% of the human race has schizophrenia, but the left part of the brain generates voices. That's why you talk to yourself. But you know you're talking to yourself because the front part of the brain knows that you're talking to yourself. Right. In schizophrenics, on an MRI scan, you see them talking to themselves uh -huh. without their permission. Oh. That is madness. What is madness? It's nothing but the left brain generating voices like it always does, right. but the front part of the brain, the conscious brain, unaware of that fact. This is incredible. Every month a new breakthrough being made in terms of understanding how we think, what is reason, what is consciousness, and maybe one day we'll be able to record it, and after you die, your memories, feelings, consciousness will survive, and you will be immortal. Yeah. A that form of immortality. Sure, right, right, yeah. Well, I mean, I studied under Richard Wilson at Middlebury College, mm. and he said something that, that I took to me even today. You know, he said, people hear the word physics, and most people want to run away. Yeah. There's something mysterious. I see it all the time at parties. <laughs> there you go, right? But, uh, but what do you say? Physics is life. You know, yeah. Physics is the, you know, it's, it's the everything. of life, right? Yeah. Everything's life. Right. So, um, well, we're here, Leadership Energy Conference. No, uh, many people mistook leadership energy conference for something that has to do with oil and gas and the sustainable energy of the, few, the future. Well, that's part of it. <laughs> right? yeah. So from, uh, from your point of view, when you heard of this conference, leadership energy, you know, what do you, what's your take on, on, on the uses? Well, science is like every other human activity. A lot of naysayers, a lot of pessimism, a lot of doubt. But sometimes somebody cuts through that just cuts through that and says, that's the way to go. And all of a sudden, a new paradigm opens up, a whole new landscape opens up. But it takes one or two people to have the nerve to say, that's the way to go. That's leadership. And again, you're not born with it. Right. It's an acquired taste. Uh -huh. But some people do have that capability in any subject, not just physics, not just sciences, but in uh, with regards to business sure. and finance. Sometimes you have to go against the tide. Right? Uh -huh. Sometimes you have to say, no, no, that's not the way to go, and this is the way to go, because you have a clear vision and you have the energy to, to uh, make it true. Okay, so that's how you see leadership energy a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think most of our audience here are more or less familiar with the word leadership, mm -hmm. perhaps less are familiar with the word energy. So mm -hmm. since, since I'm sitting here with a physicist, mm -hmm. maybe in layman term, as layman as scientifically mm -hmm. possible, yeah, yeah. could you define what, what energy well, energy is the ability to do work, okay? Period. That's all energy is. We can measure it because we can measure work. We measure velocity. We measure motion. Bingo. Sure. That's energy. Now apply that energy to human society. The ability to make things work, to make things move. That is the definition of energy. Now apply it to the social sciences. The ability to get things done. The ability to move other people the ability to assemble all these random facts and say that's the way to go and make people move in that direction, that's leadership. And it all comes from a definition, the ability to do work. To do work, right? And you see it all the time in, in, in leaders, in leadership, and maybe there is something quantifiable. Maybe there is something, you know, behind it. There's something common currency behind it, which, you know, we call leadership energy. Sometimes people say, what is greatness? Uh, what makes somebody great? I say that what makes somebody great is the fact that they change the whole field just because they're in it. Take a look at Darwin. Sure. When Darwin entered the field of you know, natural philosophy, natural history, he changed the landscape. Right. In other words, you define Darwin by saying that he changed the whole field that he was in. Right. That's leadership. You understand? In other words, somebody can come in and say, I'm a leader. Okay, well, who's to dispute you, right? But if he changes the whole political and social terrain just by being in it, that is leadership. Now, in politics, sometimes people call that charisma. But I don't think so. It's more than just charisma. It's more than a politician walking in a room and everyone says, look who just walked in the room. 
No, it's more than that. The ability to do work, to get things moving, right? That's what energy is all about. And that's why when, when people have this leadership ability, it's more than somebody saying, okay, you're the leader for today. Right. Tomorrow, you're the leader. No, 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 it's not that. It's somebody who can change the field just by being in it. Right. So you can't just create, you can't appoint energy. Right? You actually have to, in a way, extract and, and, and make use of those energy. Great. Mm -hmm. So what's next for you? Uh, well, I work in string theory, right. and uh, we want to do... Uh, experiments on the biggest explosion in history, and okay. that's the creation that's of the universe. Okay. We have the Large Hadron Collider outside Geneva, Switzerland, but it's too small. Uh, it's the biggest machine of science ever built by human hands, right? 27 miles in circumference. You can put the city of Geneva inside the machine. Because that's the one you built in the garage when you were 12? Well, it's a small version <laughs> of it, yeah. Okay. yeah. But when I was in high school, I built an atom smasher, a small version of an atom smasher that now we have a big version outside okay. Geneva, Switzerland. Sure. But the same principle, we oh. smash atoms to recreate the beginning of time. Wow. That's why we do it. So let's predict the future a little bit, right? So I guess, you know, the, the people who are following your, your, your thoughts are wondering, so what's, you know, what could be your next book? Well, I'm a futurist. Right? And uh, futurists believe that, that instead of moaning and groaning and predicting the future, you create the future. Okay? So I'm a physicist. My friends are inventing the future. For example, I know the people who invented the transistor, uh -huh. which created the computer. Sure. Uh, I know the person who invented the laser. Physicists invented the x-ray machine. Right. We invented television. We invented radio, radar, microwaves. We invented the MRI scan. We created the space program. So if you understand physics, you understand the 20th century. We physicists invented the 20th century. Think of all the great inventions of the 20th century, starting with the atomic bomb, going all the way to the microchip. Yeah. All of it traced back to the mind of a physicist. And see, that's leadership. Okay. You change things just by being in it. You change the whole political landscape or the technological landscape just by being in it. And now we're trying to go even further. We want to go before the Big Bang. We want to understand where the universe itself came from. So our universe is a bubble of some sort. It's expanding. We live on the skin of the bubble. That's called the Big Bang Theory. String Theory says there are other bubbles out there, other universes, that these universes collide and peel off baby universes. That's called the Big Bang. That's the bang. So there are other bangs out there. Too. Yeah, there are other bangs happening. It's like a bubble bath of, of bangs taking place. And again, it's a whole new paradigm shift that we physicists believe. Not just one universe, but a multiverse. Wow. A multiverse of universes. Well, you know, I could have conversations like this with you all day. Uh, let's bring it back, just a final question, for the audience out sure. there who may be non-physicists, mm -hmm. and they're, but they're, they aspire to be leaders. Mm -hmm. So any messages from your perspective, being a futurist, being a physicist, for the up-and-coming, the young leaders out there? First, you got to do your homework, okay? You just can't say one day, hey, I'm going to be a leader, okay? You got to pay your dues. You got to do your homework. But once you understand something, then you got to dream. Then you got to dream not about what is, but what could be. You got to dream about worlds that don't exist, worlds that you create because they don't exist yet, right? And then you have, once you have that vision, that clear vision of where you want to go, then you need energy, energy to, to carry it through. Now look at the history of all the great leaders of, of, the, of the past. They've all had the same thing. First, you got to know the laws of warfare, the laws of science, the laws of whatever. Right. Then you have to put it all together to have that vision, that flash of insight. That's what society should be like. And then the energy right. to carry it through. Okay, be, let me insert a sub-question uh, in my final question. So how do you get that energy? Well, you have to say to yourself, I believe in myself. You have to say to yourself, here's a vision I have. I believe in it. Like I said, with Steve Jobs, when he saw the PC, he saw the laser printer, he said, that's my vision. A PC on every desk, uh, Windows interface linking the whole world. That was his vision. And then he believed in it. And once you believe in it, you have the energy to carry it through. Okay? So many people don't believe in it. 
they say they have this vision, but they say, oh, can't be right. I mean, uh, who am I to challenge the great uh, high mucky mucks out there? Yeah. Their energy dissipates, you see? So you have to believe in your vision. You have to say, here's my vision. I believe in it. This is the way to go. And I'm going to bet my bottom dollar <laughs> that this is the way things are going to happen. So you can you focus your energy as opposed to have it dissipated. That's right. That's right. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Michelle. Many people out there will be very jealous of me right now sitting here with you. Mm -hmm. So well. thanks so much for your time, and thank you for coming to our Leadership Energy right. Summit Asia. And it's all in my books. <laughs> Great. Thank you.